Good evening, everyone. This is a meeting of the Northampton Board of Health. It's Tuesday, December 20th. It's 533. Oh, there she is. Um, this um, meeting is being recorded. Um, <clears throat> and tonight we have uh, all of our members present. Uh, Cynthia Suopis, Dallas Dukar, Suzanne Smith, and Janet Grant. And we have staff from the uh, Department of Health and Human Services, uh, Meredith O'Leary is commissioner, uh, Elliot Escura, a public health nurse, and Amy Hutchins, tell me if I get this right, the director of the Division of Environmental Health. Pretty close. <laughs> okay, um, great. Um, so we will start with a public comment session. Um, um, in the interest of time, um, our tradition has been to um, permit people to speak for two minutes. Um, uh, Madam Timer, uh, Suzanne, are you prepared to uh, do the task? I am. Great, thank you. Um, <clears throat> And um, if you, if there's someone here for public comment, please raise your electronic hand because your videos are off by design. Um, so under reactions, you should find a hand or any reaction I should be able to see, I think. I see Robin's hand raised. Um, and that's all I see right now. Um, Great, thank you. Robin, you may unmute. Thank you. My name is Robin McEwen. I'm a longtime gardener at the Northampton Community Garden and part of the group of gardeners that submitted a letter today to the Board of Health addressing the racial equity initiative underway at the garden. Multiple Black gardeners have left the community garden in recent years because of failures to address concerns of racial bias, equity, and access. Past and present gardeners of color continue to report acts of bias in the garden, and it's likely that others never even arrive as gardeners for broader reasons related to the legacy of racial inequities. Recognizing this, a growing group of gardeners has been working for the past year and a half to ask that the community garden address these critical issues in its policies and practices. To this end, these gardeners have developed a proposal including an equity and sustainability statement that articulates a commitment to addressing racial equity within the context of a community garden and incorporates a framework for action led by gardeners. This proposal is attached to the letter submitted to the board earlier today. The conditions in the environments where people live, work, learn, and recreate affect health and quality of life, and racism and racial bias in these environments correlate to negative health outcomes. Understanding this, the City Council and the Board of Health both adopted resolutions that identify racism as an ongoing public health crisis and state their commitments to action. The Community Garden's adoption of this proposal would be aligned with these City Council and Board of Health resolutions, which identify local action as essential to addressing the public health crisis of systemic racism. For these reasons, we request the Board of Health endorse the proposal that the Community Garden adopt the Equity and Sustainability Statement and create a dedicated volunteer position on the Garden Committee to coordinate this work. We would appreciate the opportunity to discuss this with you and respectfully request the topic be added to your January meeting agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Meredith, can you make Janet co-host, please? She can't start her video. I see. She is a um, co-host, I'm sorry. Uh, she is a co-host already, so perhaps. Janet, try again. There you go. Great. And you'll be able to unmute yourself as well. <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs> Welcome. Um, I see Megan and Ellie. Um, Megan, you may unmute. I'd like to have Ellie speak first, uh, if that's possible. Sure. Ellie, go ahead. You can unmute. Uh, let's see. Let's try again. Go ahead. I'm Ellie Cook, 35-year resident of Northampton, and I've been gardening for 34 years at the Community Garden. The Northampton Community Garden is a program of the Parks and Recreation Department and is managed and maintained by Volunteer Garden Committee and 
the community of gardeners. The Gardner-led Racial Equity Initiative has included outreach to the Parks and Recreation Department, Garden Committee, gardeners, community members, and city representatives. The Garden Committee and the Parks and Recreation Department have indicated that they don't have the expertise or capacity to address these issues at this time. We respect the constraints on municipal departments but believe that, it, that a commitment to issues of safety, equity, and dignity cannot be further delayed to a more convenient time. And notably, the efforts we are proposing would be volunteer-led as with other community garden initiatives. Following development of the proposal this summer, we conducted outreach to gardeners, community members, and city representatives to further familiarize the community with the proposal and receive feedback, all in anticipation of future formal coordination with the city to request adoption of the proposal. The response to this outreach has been overwhelmingly positive. Earlier this month, this initiative and its proposal were presented to the Northampton Human Rights Commission. And on December 14th, the commission voted to endorse the proposal. We're heartened by the support and note that similar initiative, initiatives adopted by other community gardens have resulted in meaningful actions, including addressing equity and access in garden plot assignments and developing safety protocols that reflect alternatives to increased police presence. Knowing of the board's commitment to addressing racial equity as a public health concern, we request that the board stand with the Human Rights Commission and endorse the proposal that the Northampton Community Garden adopt equity and sustainability statement and create a dedicated position on the Garden Committee to coordinate this important work. We appreciate the opportunity to discuss this further at your January meeting and thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Megan? You can unmute. Okay, um, no video. Hello, good afternoon. Commissioners, I'm Megan Peck, Chair of the Northampton Human Rights Commission and also a neighbor of the community gardens. I'm humbled to follow the thoughtful comments of Robin and Ellie. As they said, our commission voted to endorse a racial equity work in our last meeting. And it's probably easy to see how their, their values and their objectives align with our priorities to uphold the rights and dignity of all humans um, in their access to and use of public spaces. Uh, to denounce discrimination and to educate about meaningful equity and inclusion. Um, we really applaud the initiative of this group in demonstrating immediate allyship for Black gardeners who experience racism. Uh, their ongoing outreach and cultivation of support of other community gardeners. Um, after more than a year of this grassroots act of advocacy, they appealed to the HRC and now to you, and I'm glad they've done so. Um, as you're well aware, there is longstanding research linking racism to negative health outcomes for people of color. I also wanna support the request to appear on a future agenda. When resident advocates visit us in these city board meetings, um, mutual learning occurs and the best of circumstances, uh, they gain some insight to our rules and constraints. And we get to hear a broader range of perspectives, hopefully, and often the personal stories that can recharge and animate our work as representatives of the community. Um, I also enjoy the cross-pollination, uh, apologies for another gardening metaphor, of ideas and energy when folks from our boards and commissions talk to each other and find commonalities. Uh, last year, the HRC collaborated with another volunteer board, the Housing Partnership, to produce an event for the general public on the topic of affordable housing as a human right. Um, I will close by saying that I'm intrigued to stay on for the upcoming presentation by Councillor Maiori. Um, back to our hope for more collaborative opportunities. Perhaps the Board of Health, the Parks and Rec, HRC, and others will find a way to generate and promote local actions to address the harms to our residents' health by both systemic racism and the lack of adequate and safe reproductive health resources. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Is there anyone else here who would like to speak at public comment, public comment session? Going once, going twice. Anyone else for public comment? If so, raise your electronic hand under the, under the reactions tab. I think that's it for public comment. Thank you so much.
uh, for speaking with us. I do appreciate it. We all appreciate it. Um, and now we will go on uh, to our meeting. Would someone like to make a motion to open the meeting? Move to open the meeting. Is there a second? Second. Go ahead, Janet. <laughs> Uh, all in favor, Cynthia? Uh, yes. Suzanne? Yes. Dallas? Yes. Janet? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Um, so meeting is now open. It is 543. Um, uh, just so everyone knows, on the agenda tonight was a discussion of the tobacco regulations, but for several reasons, we will not be discussing that tonight. Um, for one is our consultant, Cheryl Sabara was supposed to be here, but then she had to, um, she was not able at the last minute to come. And the other is that apparently just yesterday, new tobacco model regulations were published. So we want to make sure we're working with the most updated version. So we will bring that back, um, in January. All right. Um, okay. Uh, hearing, um, Meredith, the gentleman from Jim's Variety is not here. I don't who know who RF is. I don't see him. Uh, is anyone who is attending tonight representing Jim's Variety for the hearing? If you could raise your hand or speak. I'd have to raise an electronic hand. <clears throat> Okay, um, I'm seeing nothing, Joanne. So at this point, um, I would ask that you ask a board member to make a motion to continue it again because we'd like them represented at the hearing. And if they don't show up next time, we'll have to make a decision about that, right? Mm -hmm. there. Yep, I'd like to give them the opportunity because we did switch mm -hmm. the dates. Maybe right. there was just some confusion on their behalf. Yep, okay. Um, would anyone like to- Oh, wait, I see a what? hand. Do I see a hand? What? RF, ask to unmute. No, that's no, that's not a hand. No? That's just my cursor. Oh. <laughs> um, would anyone like to make a motion in regards to this hearing? Uh, move to continue the hearing to the next meeting in January. Is there a second? Second. second. Cynthia, okay. Uh, all in favor, Janet? Yes. Dallas? Yes. Cynthia? Yes. Suzanne? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Okay. It's all in favor of uh, continuing the hearing until next time. Okay. Um, great. Thank you. Um, Elliot, you have some data to share with us? You want to mute? There you go. Let me uh, share my screen if I'm able. Okay. Just navigate over here. All right, so um, let me go down to our dashboard. Our dashboard this week is definitely showing, um, you know, increase in COVID since the beginning of this holiday season. Um, tests are up again this week, or cases are up again this week, rather. Um, hospitalization is down, but it's it's kind of roughly the same as last week. Um, we are still at the low risk level, although, um, as you can see, most of the surrounding counties have uh, have now risen to the medium level. And um, we've gone from substantial county transmission to high county transmission. Um, and our wastewater, both in the city and the county, is also demonstrating this trend. That blue line is Northampton. The green line is Hampshire County. Um, so that's kind of been on the rise since, uh, since early November, um, with a bit of a jump after Thanksgiving. Um, and I think with Christmas coming up, um, we can probably expect to see, um, that continuing to rise. Although obviously you never know with COVID, it mm -hmm. continues to surprise us. Um, our flu cases also continue to increase. Um, here's our flu cases for the last five years, that pink line is our flu cases this year. Um, so it is 
it is a, a heavy year for respiratory illnesses. And, and they're seeing that on the state level, even just for influenza-like illness, um, doctor's visits, really all the metrics that they use to track respiratory illness, they're seeing um, huge numbers this year. And I also wanted to point out that our the percentage of flu cases that are in pediatric patients this year is, okay. is greatly increased from previous years. So it's especially hitting the kids hard. <clears throat> I've seen the RSV numbers. Uh, we didn't used to keep track of RSV at the hospital, but we do now. And it looks like it's peaked a few weeks ago and maybe on the decline. Um, yeah. Um, thank you. Any questions for Elliot? Um, just, I don't know if we can do this or not, but the transmission rate that is high, um, can you compare it to any time last year? Like, are we, I'm just trying to get a sense of comfort. <laughs> yeah, um, you know what I can do is, uh, I don't have that right now, but I can um, reach out to you after the meeting and with some uh, comparisons. It is a little bit tricky because, yeah. um, it, you know, our case metrics are not as reliable as they used to be because so many people are um, are home testing. I also just wanted to, to note that um, Curative, which is a testing company that had sites in Deerfield in East Hampton, kind of a lot of our Western Mass sites, um, they're shutting down operations as of December 28th. So um, people will have fewer options for testing. So where do we get our stats from? Just from like testing at the hospital, like the ER and urgent care and that's it? Um, pharmacies also, they draw mm -hmm. from those labs. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just say, Cynthia, um, the number that I like to look at is percent yep. positive among asymptomatic people that we get for like pre-procedure testing before people have surgery and things like that. And that's sort of a good metric that, that I think probably still holds fairly true. At the height of Omicron, it was like 9% or something crazy. And now we're three and a half or so. We've okay. been here before, but we really haven't gone below 3% okay. in the last, you know, since uh, summer of 21, when we had like a very brief period before Delta came in. We had a very brief period where we thought immunizations worked and there was no Delta and everything was like really quiet and everyone was starting to visit each other. And then Delta came in and threw the whole thing off. But, but um, the case counts for Omicron, like last January, are just so much higher than all the other case counts, but now we can't rely on case counts, so it's very hard to compare. But um, percent positive still, I think, has some value. Anyway. Elliot, do you know, are there any of the Stop the Spread sites left standing and operating? Um, I believe the one in Holyoke. Thought so. Okay. Yeah. Oh, really? In Holyoke, this Massachusetts stopped the spread sites. I believe I'll look into it, but I okay. believe that one is still going. I try to go through about every month so our website isn't hopelessly out of date. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I yeah. can say that that's shutting down. Uh, uh, did you say the twenty eighth, Elliot? Yeah. Like, not, that is a, as well. Oh, it is. Okay. Um, and even though this isn't on our agenda and we often review the, our mask policy and I'm not suggesting we review it, but I just wanna be able to um, validate and say that we still are encouraging masks, the wearing of masks in, in public places. I very much encourage that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. CDC now encourages that. Mm -hmm. And as Tony Fauci said, you know, you don't need to wait for the CDC to yes. encourage it to wear a mask. <laughs> yeah. And if I could just ask one more question, um, Elliot, how's it going at the senior center in terms of your work there and how they are interacting with masks or no masks? Mm -hmm. um, it's It's been going well. Um, I'm getting, starting to get more and more of, uh, you know, a few people returning, you know, almost every week for, for blood pressure checks or questions. Um, in terms of, um, in terms of masking and sort of guidance, um, they've started posting paper copies as well as um, as like a pop up when the people register like that they're there in the computer. That sort of just gives a sense of like we are seeing a lot of respiratory illnesses, 
here's what you can do. Masking is among the things. Um, I know that they had a small outbreak last week, but they were able to get that under control and people were very happy to, to take precautions um, when they knew that it was kind of going around. Um, and actually, uh, a little unrelated, but um, the good news is that the latest information about vaccination is showing that Northampton has roughly 100% of people over 65 who have their primary series. Oh, primary series? Mm -hmm. Just the primary series. We don't have data on the bivalent boosters, but for the primary series, it's it's they basically as close to 100% as, as they can tell. And is that two shots or four shots? That's the two. That's the two. Okay, thank you. And just to kind of add a little more information, um, Kim Parks, who is the new director for the Senior Center, is just amazing to work with. She reaches out to us anytime they, she's made aware of a case there and asks for guidance and direction. And with the recent outbreak, what we did was not to just kind of hone in on COVID, but we wanted her to broaden it up a little bit because sometimes those messages do lay flat because we've been hearing them for two and a half years or what have you. Um, to really kind of focus on respiratory illnesses and the best practices for that overall good health. And I, I feel like any suggestion we have, she just runs with it and is doing a fantastic job. So have you guys done uh, flu vaccination over there? We have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then next month, I believe Elliot and Kim are kind of working on a new program for the senior center. We're changing days to a day that's more utilized at the senior center and we're gonna hold kind of like a, a subject of the week kind of talk. Is that what we're doing, Elliot? I don't know if you wanna explain more and then have just basic office hours too after that. Yeah, so so um, Kim and I are still working out the details of whether it'll be a talk or just, you know, um, suggested questions people can ask on a particular topic. Although of course, you know, I'm always open to any topic. Um, we're trying to figure out what will kind of be the format that best uh, will will serve people's needs. Mm -hmm. oh. Great. Fantastic. Great. So Elliot, do you mind holding on uh, and listening to um, the next presentation? Because I'd like you, if you could, because uh, I can't bomb our end right now to my office computer, share your screen and show the website sure. um, yeah. after she's done speaking. Okay, thank you. All right, any other questions for Elliot before we move on? Thank you, Elliot. Um, uh, now, Councillor Mayori, welcome. Let's see, can we, did you make her co-host? We'll just ask her to unmute. Ask her to unmute. Hi, let's see. I do, I could, do you not want my camera, my video on? No, yeah, make just give me one second, Councillor. I'm going to make no you problem. a co-host. <laughs> so we can view, see your beautiful smile. There we go. <laughs> You should be all set. Let's see. There we go. Welcome. Or my galaxy uh, wallpaper. Maybe that. <laughs> well, thank you. Welcome. Uh, welcome. Well, thank you for welcoming me, and also really uh, thank the commissioner for graciously letting me take some of your valuable time tonight. It's great to see you. Um, yeah, so I had reached out to the commissioner and as, as well as the mayor with um, some ideas. You know, ever since last June, I'm sure you're all keenly aware of the peril that uh, pregnant people are, are you know, finding themselves in since the overturning of Roe v. Wade. Uh, so I've been thinking about what to do on the municipal level. How can we kind of fortify reproductive health care? And uh, I have the pleasure of working with a, a you know a coalition both locally and just, there we go. yeah I got muted for a second oh I don't know you're okay no you're good we okay great okay I think I got muted for a sec, but I'm back um so I've been working with um some of our local resident experts on the subject, as well as you know, reaching out statewide to other legislators and counselors. So I'm working with um, Carrie Baker from Ms. Magazine and Smith College, uh, Jennifer McKenna from the Lawyer Project, uh, Cheryl Soul, CEO of Tapestry, uh, and more you know, and locally, regionally, um, uh, Councillor Owen Zarrett in East Hampton, uh, and we've 
you know, had a lot of Zoom calls with other communities like Salem, Somerville. Uh, so, you know, all discussing what can we do at the local level. There's a lot being done at the state level, as we know, you know, Massachusetts has the Roe Act um, and the, you know, the Act expanding protection for reproductive and gender affirming care. Uh, so we have that um, kind of secured in our constitution, our state constitution and the laws of our Commonwealth. But I, I still feel like the city of Northampton has a responsibility to make sure that these laws, you know, are carried out and to, to ensure the safe and fair access of reproductive and gender affirming care services on, our, on the local level. And I believe we also just, we need to make a proactive and strong statement as a municipality uh, to deter the many attempts, you know, to interfere with the rights of, of pregnant people to access their uh, reproductive health care. Um, you know, as we knew even before the overturning, there's barriers to reproductive health care. There, you know, cost, complicated insurance coverage, um, you know, especially for lower income folks. And, you know, my background's public health and I, I think, and I, and I know you know this too, it's like, it's not just about abortion. We know that the, the kind of repercussions that happen in, in, in all sorts of ways to healthcare uh, when something like this happens. So um, what I, you know, my first thoughts and I'd love to, you know, follow up. This is really to plant the seeds. It's kind of a big topic and there's so much to unpack, but I wanted to plant some seeds here tonight of potential collaboration. And also I would welcome just, I want to, before I forget, you know, any feedback at any point from you, you all about ideas um, that make this happen in our community, you know, to help really fortify our uh, rights for our community members. But what I proposed to um, the commissioner and the mayor and what I'm thinking about doing on council are three things. I proposed um, that the city have a reproductive health um, care um, site on the website with lots of links um, for folks and community members. You know, the, uh, so the, the mass, um, you know, mass health, mass department of health, the AG's office all now have a crisis pregnancy center advisory warning, a very, you know, um, very clear warning to residents of Massachusetts about the, the, you know, the threat that sometimes crisis pregnancy centers um, have for people seeking care. And I think that that's something that we could, we could do. My, the, my, my, my advisory team there has already actually written, you know, drafted uh, a website and done the work for the city if they're interested in using any of that. Um, so I think that's something that we could do. And uh, the other um, thing that I was proposing is emergency contraception dispensers. Um, and I've met with um, other cities, Salem's also um, as Sif Salem has started that process. And I had a, a lot of concerns actually about, you know, what that would look like and, you know, the, and it, it's actually, it's, um, there's, the way that Salem's doing it is there's a company that leases them and, and, man, and maintains them. And there's ways to prevent sabotage and there's ways to kind of, um, you, can, you, you can use them for many things. You can use them for, um, emergency contraception, you can use them for prophylaxis, you can use them for Narcan, you can use them for menstrual products. So you have some sort of, uh, you know, you have a little leeway that way in deciding where you put them. But generally, you know, in Sam's putting them in public places, you know, we could conceivably have it in our future resilience hub or in you know, the bathroom at the, at, at, the, at City Hall. Um, and it provides them at some cost, but, but at cost. It's, it, it, for example, maybe $7 for, um, for emergency contraception versus like 40 bucks. Uh, so that's one, one thought. And the leasing is great because it's only, it's like $5,000 a year, which is not, you know, it's not a lot for maintaining these really, they're very high tech um, dispensers. So that's another idea I'd love for you to kind of percolate. Um, and then the other thing, uh, those are both those, both those things really have to come out of the mayor's office or really more executive <laughs> branch decisions, but I just wanted to encourage them and support them and happy to help with them. Um, the one thing that I can do as a counselor is look at kind of ordinances and and what can we do that way. And so there, I've been working with, you know, with this team and with um, Councilor Zaret to draft a uh, an ordinance called the Safe and Fair Access Ordinance. 
Uh, this ordinance has been passed in Salem um, and approved by the now Lieutenant Governor uh, Kim Driscoll. Uh, and so it's, um, and it's also been proposed, it's in process in East Hampton. Um, it's being used by reproductive equity now, with reproductive equity now as part of the state's uh, rogue coalition that's being used as their municipal, you know, as a template for their municipal toolkit. It's been vetted by legal teams. Um, the lawyering project, by the way, has offered to represent pro bono any municipality that, that passes any kind of ordinance like this and is sued. Um, so that kind of, um, you know, that's helpful to know. And so, but really, so I'll explain the, the twofold part of this ordinance. It's still, you know, I'm still drafting it. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm drafted it, but I'm still tweaking it for Northampton and working with our solicitor. Uh, but really, it's not, there's no, what it, it doesn't really require enforcement. So there's the safe, um, which is basic, there's a, a shield law um, as part of the ordinance that all, all it really does is say that municipal employees cannot use information um, that they obtain about. Uh, either either providers of abortion and reproductive care or those seeking reproductive care, um, kind of use that you, they can't sell them or use them nefariously or give them give them to other you know states that have prohibited abortion. They can't use them like that. And the mechanism, the trigger mechanism in the ordinance is simply to, to bring it to personnel um, of of a municipality. So it's not there's not the enforcement in the sense of uh, a fine or the Board of Health getting involved in that part. It's really just to bring it to light to, to, uh, to personnel of a municipality to kind of ensure this because, you know, uh, you know these, the Citizens for Life groups have, have stated that their, their goal is to come to places like Northampton and, in, and, and increase um, the presence of cri crisis pregnancy centers and this is like a billion dollar industry and the state is being collected but often without the knowledge of folks. And so it's a way of kind of trying to rein in what happens to that, to that information. So that's one part of the ordinance. And the other part is prohibiting deceptive practices in um, deceptive, deceptive advertising practices with crisis pregnancy centers, which is really just what's going on at the state level. So what it does is just simply facilitate the state level process. So like on a website, we would, there's a complaint process that the AG's office has now put in place about deceptive advertising and crisis pregnancy centers. This is not a first amendment issue. This isn't about changing speech. This is about issuing you know, the right to, um, to file a complaint. And this is about making that that process easier and sharing that information about that process with our community members. So what we would do at a municipal, on the municipal level is we would have on the website a way or maybe even some help with folks who want help filing a complaint, um, but it would be utilizing the state process around that. Originally, there was a fine attached to that, you know, when we, and then we realized that there was some issues around that legally. So this one is just, Really, to kind of emphasize the, and 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 kind of streamline um, the state process on that. Uh, so that's um, that's the, the overview of of what they would do. Uh, so the board of health's role in, in this would really just be really a, you know informational, educational. Um, it's there, it's not an enforcement position for the board of health. So um, that's what we're you know that's where we're at with that. Um, Uh, you know, the crisis pregnancy, so there's other aspects certainly to be looked at with crisis pregnancy centers. I know some other um, municipalities are looking at, can we require Cori checks um, for some of the, these are, some of them have license, medical licensure, some of them don't, but we, we have um, places often without any medical, um, you know, medical professionals or licensure giving ultrasounds. We don't even know if they're transvaginal or what kind of ultras ultrasounds to minors without, and, you know, and, and, just, and often distribute, you know, so what happens is they're kind of luring, the, the reason we're focusing on, on the, the deceptive advertising is because 
people in crisis or people, uh, pregnant people who are looking for care are, are kind of being sidetracked and, and, and deceived by information like seeking abortion care. And then it will say a crisis pregnancy center. They go there, they often receive um, faulty information or ultrasounds that, that, that fail to give them vital information like ectox, ectox pregnancies, the accurate, um, you know, the um, accurate information about how far along they are. And interestingly enough, 80% um, of folks seeking, who go, to, go through CPCs um, are, are, are actually, you know, planning to carry the term. And so what they're doing is they're delaying real care by, by being sidetracked by this deceptive advertising and lured in. And, you know, another thing that I would love to talk about and just in generally in the community is the other lure is like free diapers or things like, and sometimes they're there and sometimes they're not, but this that really seems a kind of early support, seems like something our community could do without folks feeling like they'd have to go to a place that has questionable practices. So that's something I'd like to pursue as just on a community level. Can we provide, consistently provide some of the, you know, some of the things that trigger folks to go in there. But the other is really scary part, and this is, these are not covered in our ordinance, I'm just kind of, naming them is that data is collected on these folks and and you know we we don't know what happens to that data and it's it's a scary time for, for data to be collected um like that uh you know and as i said it's the you know it is the plan to, to kind of proliferate pro, proliferate these these centers um in a re, you know in response to and in response to massachusetts being um precisely codifying reproductive rights. So I think this is an area of concern and I would hate for us just to say, oh, the state's covering it in this way. I think we need to do better than that. And I think we can, especially in Northampton. So I'm hoping, um, you know, I'm hoping that you all think about that and I may, perhaps I can come back with more, you know, when it becomes a more solid plan, but I just really wanted to plant the seeds with you all. You all. Boards of Health, you know, are pivotal in communities and of course have you know a lot of power and and I, I would love to hear your thoughts and if I can answer questions or, or send information later I didn't want to overwhelm you know send a lot of information your way right this moment you know moment but I'm happy to um to to answer questions at any point or emails or whatever but thank you um yeah thank you very much thank you so much that was really interesting um are these centers claiming to be giving medical care? Yes. There must be a way we can control them with licensure. I mean, you have to have a license to do ultrasounds and... Uh, Meredith, do you know anything about that? Um, so, I don't know specifically what type of medical care that they are giving on site. I do know that if you are and LA can probably there's lots of articles out there um and stories people that have used these CPCs that they have searched for places to get information on abortions or the procedure and they'll get hits for these CPCs that are advertising that they do um uh abortions or provide resources for abortion care and then when they get in there it's you know it's it's really honestly to help their pro-life to change the mind of the person seeking to get more information about abortion. Um, and people feel strong-armed and um, confused. Um, it's really, yeah, it's de deceptive practices is just the best word to, to describe it. My question I had for you, counselor, though, is I know that there is a mechanism in place to file a complaint with the AG's office, yeah. but can you do it anonymously? Because I, I think that is right there. Um, you know, if we if that if you can't do it anonymous, anonymously, it might not get done, and that's where we could perhaps be of assistance. It's very interesting you brought that up because I brought that up last week. I had the same concern. We actually have sent. You know, we um, we we had some folks who had complaints, and we we went through the process. And a, it was a little more tedious than I would like it to be. It mm -hmm. wasn't, you know, wasn't that user friendly. But b, you know, it, it, they say 
it, it's confidential, the, the AG's office says it's confidential, but you really have to file under, you know, a name. So I would like to see either providers or the city be able to play that role for folks to, to give them that, because you're right, like, I don't know that people will want to file a complaint um, if that's so. Uh, so, yeah. Um, yeah, so that's what, so I think that process needs to be, and I'm hoping with our new administration, you know, that we'll get that a lot of that sorted out. So that has to kind of go in tandem. That's kind of why, you know, I wanted our, our the, you know, municipal governments involved to, to help with that too. Um, yeah. And I, I just want to say, you know, they're all, they also, the other thing that's being pushed, um, you know, CPCs have different, like there's Bethlehem, Bethlehem, Bethlehem House and East Hampton. I don't think they provide medical care, but Clearway and Springfield does. And, you know, they, uh, like the American College of uh, gynecologists and obstetrics, you know, they, gynecology and obstetrics, they've condemned the, uh, the abortion pill reversal idea as dangerous, and that's being kind of uh, perpetuated as well. So really kind of, um, and the Abortion Fund of Massachusetts has noted a serious uptick in those seeking services from, out, from those outside of Massachusetts, um, and these CPCs will precisely be preying on them to, to, in an attempt to divert them from seeking care. So it, I think it's all gonna, I, th that's just to say, I think it's gonna, it's, we're, we're looking, we're gonna see a rise of both CPCs and those potentially um, harmed by them. But yeah, it, it, I think there's a lot of questionable, you know, I think the interesting, I, I've been looking into the licensure around it. It's, I'm, I'm kind of shocked at how little oversight there is and I don't really understand how that is, can be, but it, there seems to be a, a, a lot of, you know, you, it sounds like you don't, you can have an ultrasound machine without <laughs> a lot more. <laughs> Are there other um, CPCs besides, you know, in Western Mass, besides East Hampton and Springfield? Like how yeah. pervasive are they? Yes, there are. I actually have a chart. Um, Jennifer McKenna was just researching that. Um, there are several and I could send that information to you. And they have different levels of medical care or not, you know, but um, but yes, there there are several, at least, at least seven, you know. The I closest have, one to Northampton is East Hampton. Is that? Uh, uh, yes, that one, but that one does not provide, I don't believe they're trying, or at least misrepresenting any kind of medical care. Clearway and Springfield um, does provide what they call it medical care. And, you know, so what happens and the reason, I, you know, even though we don't have one in Northampton, although we could get one, would, it's yeah. important for us to do as a municipality is because it impacts our residents, it impacts our community members. If you, I was talking to Cheryl Zoll from Tapestry, they keep trying to raise funds to up their advertising game because if you put in, you know, seeking, you know, seeking abortion in Google, the first thing that comes up is clear way and Tapestry can't pay enough. To, to kind of get above that, you know, information. I mean, tapestry doesn't do, you know, but information about abortion. So it's it's pretty, yeah. So so it's kind of that's why it's even if you know that's why it's important for municipalities to, to help residents with it, even if it's they don't have them in, within their borders. Elliot, I think Elliot's been doing a little research too. If you. Yeah, that. so based on the information that you sent over to the DHHS, um, I'm going to share a screen. We actually have a, a draft, or not a draft, it's live, uh, a beginning of a, a web page, um, kind of oh, wow. similar to what you were speaking about. How exciting. Um, so, you know, just saying like, you know, it, it, it's still legal. Um, we have a list of the four um, CPCs known in our area um, that do not offer abortion. Um, although they sometimes claim to, um, two in Springfield, one in East Hampton and one in Greenfield. Um, and I believe there's one out in the Berkshires as well. Um, and then just a link on, um, plenty of resources that people may need, um, you know, funding, um, patient navigation, uh, legal helpline, um, a page, um, with uh, trans specific resources, um, as well as some local medical providers and kind of what, like for example, what they can provide and what they can't. So people know, depending on how far along they are, you know, what options are available to them locally. Wow, this is like a holiday present. 
This is exciting to see. I think it's wonderful. And just to comment on the gender affirming, you know, not, I, I don't know so much about the CPCs around us on this issue, but nationally what is happening is this infrastructure is being put in place to do the same kind of deception with those seeking, you know, transitional, you know, hormone, transitional hormone therapy and um, that they're, they're being sidetracked by these the same, the same mechanism. So that's why we mentioned gender affirming care because it's so easy to make that leap in the same way. Dallas. So thank you for that. That's wonderful. Thank you, Elliot. Dallas. Okay. You're still muted. Sorry. Hey. Um, I was going to ask a question on the gender affirming care bit. So, you know, there are actual action steps that are being committed to obviously at the, the state level uh, to protect both reproductive health care and gender affirming care. And then I'm hearing a lot of specific action items to reproductive health care on the Northampton level. Yeah. I'm wondering if there's been any consideration to additional action items, either executive or legislative, around protecting access to reproductive uh, gender affirming care. Right. Sorry, can well, you in hear the me right. In the ordinance, we we you know we we lay out the similar kind of um, you know protections. But, but yeah, I mean, that's something maybe we need to kind of, you know, bolster. Because it sounds like the safe and fair access ordinance, what you were mentioning spoke yeah. specifically to abortion providers and prohibiting advertising of crisis pregnancy centers. Is that right? Right. But it all, but the, 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 the fair, the, the safe part is also about gender affirming care. That language is in the ordinance. Um, yeah. So I don't know. Would you want to share your draft um, or not yet? Well, I'm 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 in conversation with um, our solicitor about about that. So perhaps after it's vetted by the solicitor, I'd love to. I, I mean, that's really why. I mean, I love really your feedback. I mean, that's it would be it would mean a lot to me. And like Dallas said, like we can see if that language is strong enough. And and so that's great. Yeah, I mean, that's something. Um, I definitely want to make sure it happens. So yeah, so we're working on the, it, you know, it passed in Salem. Uh, Solicitor Seawold has concerns, um, and so we're kind of tweaking, uh, you know, we're tweaking it and looking at it um, again. But um, I'd be happy to share share it with you. Yeah, yeah I'd be happy to review it. Oh, good. great, Alice. Thank you. That would be really great. Any other comments or questions? Dallas, go ahead. One other thing I just wanted to mention was um, with that website, so at least on the gender affirming care for and with reproductive health care for a while, there has been uh, security issues with listing uh, the clinics or the providers as well. And at least in gender affirming care, we are seeing many providers remove themselves from publicly listed wow. areas due to threat, you know, bomb threats at Boston Children's Hospital or other security concerns. So it may be something just to think about when you're thinking about putting resources in a public space, like a website, is how people may also use that for nefarious means too. That's a good point. Um, yeah, it's something we're definitely, gonna, we're definitely gonna need feedback on to do properly or, uh, and I just want to say, you know, there is a version, not, you know, it's not um, template, it's, it's a template that Reproductive Equity now has put out the Safe and Fair Access Ordinance. And that's public. I mean, if you get that, if you get their newsletter, you can see. So that really would, you can, and I can send that to you if you'd like. I mean, that would just shows you the general kind of direction of an ordinance. And then I'm creating out of that, um, I'm, I'm modifying one for Northampton. But if you didn't want to wait, you could look at that one and the language about gender affirming care in that one, I can send that one. Yeah. Um, this is not my area of expertise, but I was able to do a quick search because I was wondering about access, current access to emergency contraception and birth control. And apparently in Massachusetts, if you have health insurance, they say certain kinds of health insurance, but health insurance, um, you can get a free access to emergency contraception. There is a standing order at all pharmacies and you can just walk in and ask for emergency contraception at no cost to yourself. So I appreciate 
the the efforts to expand access but i think in these materials it would probably be very important to make that known to um residents that that's already available before there's any investment in um any technology um just as i i think one of the one of the great benefits of living in massachusetts is the um, that, that this is the state with the highest proportion of insured residents. Uninsured residents are less than 3%. That's insur health insurance status is not going to be available to everyone, but for those who have it, it seems that there's already um, an access point that people may not be aware of. Elliot? Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, most of the laws outlining what insurance has to cover and how in the state only, uh, they don't apply to self-funded plans, which are insurance plans people get through most um, large unions or major employers. Um, so um, I think it's very important to also continue to, to um, give people the ability to access this care outside of it, um, because over half of um, workers in Massachusetts are, are covered under um, self-insured plans, which means that they don't have to abide by, for example, um, covering gender affirming care or certain kinds of reproductive health care. So I just wanted to put that point out No, I understood. It's it's not going to be an option for everyone, but I, I'll bet there are a lot of people who have health insurance under which emergency contraception um, is eligible who don't know that. And I, I thought that that would be an important um, item to have under any any website or any access to care materials. Anyone else? I agree, Suzanne. Cynthia? Um, Councillor, thank you so much for bringing this to our attention. And I just wanted to ask, first of all, what Elliot, what you showed us looks great. Are we going to um, put that up soon or are we waiting for something or? Um, um, it is currently up. If you go to the okay. DHHS page, there's a um, button. You can go through all the menus to get to it, but there's also a, a button right on the um, right hand side of the page that that has Perfect. direct access. And and counselor, um, thank you. That's great. And counselor, um, when you said you're working on the ordinance ordinance language with the city attorney, is there some kind of a vulnerability you can share? I mean, a legal exposure to the city or something by working on this? I um, mean, well, it's interesting because it's been vetted by many legal teams. So, you know, I, I, one thing I've learned as a counselor, sometimes it seems like legal interpretations are more, you know, more subjective or more, you know, there's a lot of disagreement. So uh, I think there's a lot of questions. There's a lot of questions about, you know, what's overreach, what's being the executive branch, what's what can counselors can we can counselors um, kind of make a mandate that uh, you know for for um, the executive or for city employees can we you know that kind of thing? I mean, I think the key here is that we're not you know it's not an enforcement piece. It gets more complicated if we wanted to have a fine or, uh, but really this is it's really a way of just kind of streamlining a process. So that's what we're talking about is like what. You know what's in, and that's kind of also where I think the Board of Health is just you know has has powers that council doesn't. If if that does become the case, that there's things we want to do that really are an overreach for council that, that you all could you all could consider doing them. But yeah, that's what I'm talking about right now is just looking at the language, making sure that it it's clear about you know what you know what we can do as in from the legislative branch. Uh, I mean, okay. it was passed in several municipalities, so, so so others are disagreeing with him. So I just that's why we need to sure. Oh, so the next the next the plan is to stand with, with uh, Solicitor Seawald and you know folks from the lawyering project and people who have who have uh, vetted this process and 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 figure out what you know if we can find a, a meeting place in terms of language. I, I guess it's just that you know I feel a responsibility for access to care. In our community, and so anything that stands in that way seems to me to ha have a further conversation. So, so thank you. I hope you keep us informed of your progress. Thank you. Dallas, did you want to speak again? You're you're still muted. 
sorry. I was just reviewing uh, the new website and it looks really great too. And um, one recommendation I might add in the future uh, is that we are seeing some uh, out-of-state refugees start to arrive in Northampton in the surrounding area for gender-affirming care as well. And um, there is a lot of good information here around reproductive health care access and a lot of disinformation around gender-affirming care. So there might be room in the future to consider uh, also providing more information about that, maybe not specific clinics that could be put at security risk, but even some additional information. And obviously that might be more of an executive component here, but something to think about as we see, um, you know, people traveling from Well, I really value this kind of feedback. That's amazing. I just I can't tell you how thrilling it is to see the website. And I, I hope that it'll be okay for me to reach out to get more of your feedback, you know, Dallas, what we were talking about, but uh, because I, I would really love um, not only your support, but really your insights on this, um, both the ordinance and, and the other ideas we have, you know, I have, or if you have other ones. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Councillor, can you can you let us know where South, uh, excuse me, East Hampton is at? They've been working on their ordinance for a while now. I'm just right. Wondering. I yeah. So the East Hampton, um, their their uh, health department has signed off on it, um, and it's really the same. So there there is in support of it, but I, I think it's in a I think it's in a, league, a legislative committee. Okay. Um, there was an original ordinance that was introduced with a fine and then um, Councillor Jarrett withdrew that one and put in this one that's very similar to the one I'm working on. Okay. Um, he really did a lot of the authoring. I'm just really um, grateful to him. But then so it was changed to the just really streamlining the process. So it had to go back in East Hampton had to go back through the process. So it's, it's somewhere in there. Um, but I can certainly find out and give you an update. And if you ever, you know, I don't know if you talk to the East Hampton Health Department, but they, I'm sure they have some interesting things to say since they are in support of it. That's fantastic. Yeah, I'll reach out to her. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is such an important topic. I, I, I mean, with I think I've said it before, with the stroke of a pen, half centuries of work has just been undone um, and affect so many, I can't even, countless number of, of people. It's really disheartening. Um, I think at this point, if I'd like to offer anyone, if you have any resources that you know of that aren't on the website, um, thoughts, if you can send them both to Elliot and I, any suggestions, um, we can do the legwork, we can vet things. Um, but yeah, it, I think it was a great start. Elliot, thank you for getting that up there for us. Um, but yeah, we appreciate any input. Okay, yeah, I can send you the, the chart of the, the regional uh, mm -hmm. CPCs. And I can, I, I think, um, Commissioner, did I send you a, a, just a template you can draw from that, that um, Cheryl Zoll and the Gary Bate? But I can send that to you. Um, and what, and I can, I can, yeah, and I can send the ordinance when, we, when it's ready. But I can also just send the, 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 temp, the, the generic template ordinance that has a, the general, you know, tenants. If you'd like that, I can send those things. Great. And then I think also maybe, and we can take this conversation offline, thinking about a mechanism where um, the public can file complaints anonymously, you know, not necessarily going through the AG. That that might take a while to get streamlined and, and fixed, but if we could mm -hmm. do something here locally, um, I'd really like to, to help and participate in that any way I can. Ah, that's amazing. Yes. I think that's this is a, this is an opportunity for like again for municipalities sometimes to be in the forerunners, mm -hmm. you know, yep. be the models for what should happen at the state level. So that's it, definitely something that should happen. It should be much more user friendly than our participants mm -hmm. found. Mm -hmm. so, okay, let's we'll we'll follow up on that. I'll follow. Up. Okay. Thank you so much for your work on this. Oh, sure. Well, thank you for your, oh, this is a lot of time and I really appreciate it. I'm just really grateful, especially now to be in a community with you. So good, have a great night and, and a happy holiday season. Thank, thank you so you. much. You too. Oh, oh very interesting. Um, Meredith, is uh, Hamid um, our friend from Jim's Variety? I will ask them to unmute.
Ahmed, are you here and representing Jim's Variety for the tobacco hearing? Uh, yes. We have Mr. Amario. I can't really hear you. Um, you might have to speak into your speaker a little more. Can you hear me now? It's in and out. You want to try again? Yeah. Um, let me see. I'm, I'm trying to turn the volume up and see if uh, you guys can hear me. Hello? Yep. I'm not sure if it's my connection. We no, can't okay. hear you very well. Yeah, we're not. We're having issues hearing you. Can, I try to reach you? can you turn up your volume? The volume is, I can see, I can hear you. Hello? Yeah, so we're still having issues hearing you. You're fading in and out. Let's try one more time. Okay, can you guys hear me? That's a little better. You're a little fuzzy though. Okay, should I reconnect? You wanna leave and come back? Yes. Okay. We'll wait for you. Thank you. I'll be right back myself. Um, all right. While we're waiting, um, does anybody have a chance to look at the minutes? I know they just went out today. So if you haven't had a chance to look at them, Cynthia, you haven't had a chance? Um, we could just bring them back next time. I, did everyone see them? I, I don't think I saw them. They came with the agenda. I saw I, them. I actually didn't get that. <laughs> All right, so why don't we put it off till next time? Okay. Minutes off till next time, so everyone has a chance to read them. We didn't get it until about maybe three in the afternoon. Wow. Right. Um, who did they come from? Because I was, I was kind of waiting for it. Okay. With the agenda. Yeah. Everything's a little late because she thought she forgot that Kelly was out. Um, Ahmed, I'm going to unmute you. You want to try again? Can you guys hear me now? You're very faint and a little fuzzy. Can you turn up your volume as high as it goes? You can unmute again. Okay, can you guys uh, hear me now? Um, not great. So, Hamid, um, at this point, I don't think it would be fair to you or to the Board of Health members to hold the hearing not being able to hear you very well. So, we, um, they made a motion early on in the meeting because it was supposed to be scheduled at 5.35 to continue to January. And what I can offer is um, either, I don't know if you have enough access to another device where we could hear you better, or you could come to the health department and we have a meeting owl and one of my staff will sit with you in the health department and we'll host the hearing together from there. And that way we can um, clearly hear you and you can present at that point. Would that sound okay? Yes, uh, that sounds okay. If you guys can, um, I, I really appreciate if you guys can do that uh, since uh, there's an issue here. Um, so, it, yeah, that, that would be fantastic. It'll be the third Thursday. January 19th. January, January 19th at 5.30 if you could be at the health department. Okay, okay, that sounds good. Okay, and we'll and we'll follow up in a letter and call you after after this, anyways. Well, uh, thank you for for coming. Um, sometimes technology, it's good when it works, and it's not when it doesn't. But we'll make it happen. Understandable. Uh, okay. All right. Thank you. We'll see you next month. Right, thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um. So um. 
I think that's all we had on our agenda. Um, the calendar. Kelly sent out a few weeks ago, or did she send it only to me? Uh, calendar, which basically goes through the year of uh, meetings being on the third Thursday. Has anyone, did you guys get that or was it just me? I don't believe so. Okay, I will send that calendar out so you guys can review it. I was going to propose that we stick to that schedule best we can. Um, I know Dallas, sometimes you have conflicts, so if you could look through your calendar in that one. And <clears throat> that Thursday in August, my daughter is getting married that weekend after, so I might propose that we just skip the August meeting like we often do. And um, congratulations. Thank you. Um, all right, so I'll send that around so everybody can look at their look at their schedules. Um, all right. Um, I think that's all we had on the agenda. Uh, we usually review our mask advisory. Does anybody have any comments about the mask advisory, which is still in effect? It still holds it from my point of view. Um, all right, uh, Meredith, did you have any updates or anything else you wanted to uh, include? We're gonna uh, put off the minutes uh, until next month, because not everybody got to see them since they just. Oh, yes, yeah. my apologies for those who aren't on um, the meeting earlier. Um, Kelly has been out and I just didn't realize how much she, I know how much she does for me. I just <laughs> I let the ball drop. She's been out for almost a week and I didn't think about sending the agenda and the minutes until um, Joanne let me know that she didn't receive it today. So my bad. <laughs> I'm sorry no about that. No problem. No problem. Um, um, anything else? So a couple of things, I guess, just really quickly, since we have a few extra moments. Um, we have been for well over two months um, looking for a public health nurse, actually two of them, because we have two full-time nurses in our department. And then I have the regional work that we do that we had two part-time contractors, but now I'm looking to hire one full-time public health nurse for the region too. And all three of them work together as a team. Um, so we really haven't gotten a lot of interest in that position. Um, I think maybe over the two months and after multiple times of posting it on, you know, the city website, um, with all of our colleagues, with our, you know, our, um, affiliations that we have begging friends to, you know, send it to all of their friends. I think we only got six applicants. Um, I know the nation is, you know, we are in a workforce crisis right now, um, but this was, uh, this was very, very challenging. I am happy to say I finally filled one of those positions. Kelly Hughes is going to be starting after the new year. Kelly Hughes has actually been an MRC volunteer, I think since 2013. I remember Kelly coming and giving vaccines with my mom in the early days when I started here. Um, so I know of her, I know her work, I know her personality. Um, and I'm so excited. I feel like she'll be able to bring a lot of perspective. Um, she works in uh, Valley Medical right now um, to the department and yay, one filled. So we have one open public health nurse position still. I have, um, I don't know if you saw the press release, but um, Sean Donovan is no longer uh, the DCC implementation director. He had stepped down from his position just shy of a year, um, but he did identify during that year that um, the DHHS really needs a division director of community cares, not an implementation director. We also need a DCC coordinator. I need an executive director. These are all job descriptions that are in the process of getting rated right now through the HR system. So hopefully in the next week or just right after the new year, you'll see um, job descriptions up for those if you can help circulate that, which is fantastic. And then I don't know if you saw the press release last week or the week before about um, the upcoming purchase of um, First Baptist Church on Elm Street. Did you guys see that? Yep. So that's going to be the new home of the Resilience Hub. It's 99.9%, .9 almost uh, the ink dry. 
um, which is fantastic. I went to see the space last week. It's beautiful. Um, the the bones are good. Um, the, it's plumb. The electric has been updated. Um, Eric Schur is the current property owner, and he was going to um, make it into, I believe, another concert venue, a smaller concert venue in the city. So regardless, um, it's the property is just gorgeous. Um, the dwelling itself, it's one of the finest pieces of architecture, I think, in Northampton. Just it still has some of the stained glass in there. It's just beautiful. So if it does go through, the Resilience Hub will be on the ground floor. And then the first floor will just be an open community room for community events, um, just, just a very kind of flexible space on the second floor, maybe with a few offices also on the second floor. And then on the top floor will be the uh, DHHS home to some of my staff. Um, it is not large enough to, to house all of the staff. And um, you know, as we continue to scale up, we're still gonna need more space. So I just wanted to let you know that's happening. And I believe I let you know last meeting that we got the EAPS grant. So um, we need to spend that down. That contract is, will be executed for the 1st of January. And we'll have to spend that down um, by the end of June. Can you remind us what that is? Yes, equitable approaches to public safety. So uh, just back for a second to the resiliency hub. I don't, I can't figure out how to raise my hand, like my yellow hand on this thing, but. Um, Under reactions. Yeah. yeah, I just, it's just showing like recognize hand gestures, but it's not letting me click on a hand. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, I'm just, so is Eric Shore selling the building to the city? Yes, the city is purchasing it. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> yeah <That's> great <laughs> yeah so Wayne Fiden who actually um retired me within the last year has still yeah. been working I mean the out of the climate report that he put out um years and years ago had identified the need for a resiliency hub and um still fully vested on helping find a space that can meet the you know all of the wants and needs and wishes um of the community and um even though he is in vietnam right now he has still been you know on the team and trying to find the most perfect space for for this to land so i thank you wayne <laughs> i hope you're enjoying retirement um <laughs> so yeah it's been a process because i mean just what you said about he was thinking it'd be another music venue and my understanding is many of the music venues that he does have now are not even open so i don't know why he would want another music venue to not open i don't know but well, i think he he purchased that property years ago pre-covid that was the plan mm -hmm. so, I, see. I think he's had it for the last 10 years maybe um I think he had it when I moved here in 2005. I, I'm serious, and I and I thought at that time it was being built out as an event space, mm -hmm. but there was an issue with inadequate parking. There's no parking. That's inadequate. <laughs> <laughs> There's four parking spaces that will come with this. That's it. But for for um, um, people who aren't depending on cars, that. It, that location close to center downtown is is mm -hmm. a really ideal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but things I, I I think about you know so the, it works for the resilience hub. But when I think about like the DHHS and public facing, I don't think it's ideal for the public to come in and drop off a permit or pick up, pick up paperwork. So I really have to think about what that looks like long term. Um, but yeah. Yeah, he, he's, I, I think he still has quite a few properties that he owns that are vacant and just kind of sitting, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So for him to let this go is, you know, we're grateful. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? Um, just in response to um, the folks we heard in the public comment session, I thought we would um, put the... Um, community garden issue on our agenda for January and invite those folks to come speak with us. 
Um, and you should have all received in your email today a statement from them, a letter from them. Mm -hmm. um, That's a chock full January agenda. Chock full with um, some in depth topics. Yes. So to make up for our short meeting today. <laughs> well, I mean, and what about Cheryl Sabara? Will she be coming as well in January? So I sent her an email um, to see if she's available. I'll let you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think the uh, the hearing will be brief. Yep. Um, so there'll be the community garden folks and the discussion with Cheryl about the, the model regs. Um, and I will send out the new, I haven't had a chance to review them. They literally hit my inbox yesterday. Um, so I'll send them out to you all so you can see them beforehand. Um, I, I, hopefully they're um, clearly marked what's changed from the last model regs. Um, and then either Cheryl or she now has a new counterpart. Her name is Lisa and I, uh, I can't remember her last name. But she works for the MMA Mass Municipal Association. Do you know her, Janet? Who I'm no? No, I don't. Okay. Um I think if Cheryl is unable to attend, we can ask Lisa to attend. She was gonna step in last minute, but with she probably took DJs. She did take DJs Yeah. Job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um is there an expectation that there'll be a follow-up discussion about the women's reproductive health issue that was introduced today at yeah. next month. I don't know next month. Um, I'll, I'll connect with the counselor. Okay. At least we can keep you updated as we move along. Any other comments? I, yeah, I mean, I, I just, thought of this just now, but it occurred to me when we brought back up the community garden uh, statement and what they're looking for in terms of initiative. And I didn't think to ask it at the time, are they only talking about the garden on Burt's pit or wouldn't anything they do be, isn't there another community garden in Northampton? Well, it's the other community garden is Grow Food Northampton, but the city does not own that one. Okay, so this is the only one that the city owns. Okay. It owns in the sense that the Department of Parks and Recreation oversees it. Okay. Yeah. So Grow Food Northampton <laughs> is not a city entity. Correct. It's a nonprofit. Correct. Um, and Janet and Dallas, you probably are not aware, but I will send out um, a couple of years ago, we as the Board of Health wrote a statement um, about um, um, racial equity um, and how it applies to the Board of Health. So I'll send that to you guys so you can Great. see what statement we have made in the past. Um, mm -hmm. Anything else? I'd like to, I wonder if that's on our website. I'd like to get that on our website. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually, Meredith, if you could, I sent an email to Kelly about that statement. So we passed it in 2020, but there is no date on that statement okay. at all. And so um, it would be great to get a date as to when we approved it. Sure. Could you forward me that email? Sure. That you sent to Kelly. So it's on the top of my email list. Sure. Okay. Um, just to let you all know, I'm going to be taking time off between now and the end of the year. I have a lot of time that if I don't use, I lose. So I'll be working just a little bit. Good you for you. Yeah. <laughs> no working from home. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we need you fresh in 2023. Uh, that's my goal. That's my goal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anything else? Anybody? All right. If not, would uh, anyone like to make a motion? I'll make a motion to adjourn the meeting. Is there a second? Second. Oh, I hope. Did someone take minutes? It's recording. Okay. Oh, so Kelly can write minutes from that. Okay.
Um, great, thank you. Um, all in favor, uh, Dallas? Aye. Cynthia? Yes. Suzanne? Yes. Janet? Yes. Joanne? Yes.